awesome to be here tonight, and I'm sure probably the majority of the room are veterans or spouses of veterans. If you're a veteran, would you just stand up so we can thank you for your service? I wake up every morning and know who pays that price for my freedom. Thank you. Before you have them sit down, yes. what did you want to tell them? Uh, I was just getting ready to say, for each one of you, I have a box of Girl Scout cookies, so don't leave the room without cookies. Or if you're a spouse here, of a veteran, then grab one too. They're all up here set out for you. Just a little way that we can say thank you. Thank you very much. As, as you can imagine, um, August 2nd, 2006 was a day that forever changed my life. That's the day that we were notified that my son, Mark Allen Lee, had been killed in action. And I woke up that morning and uh, was living in Kingswood Park over in Surprise and woke up and did my normal walk that day. and. Um, did whatever else I was doing, did a little shopping, and came back home, and that night was Wednesday night, and the church that I went to, I belonged to a Bible study, a small group, and we had not met the week before, which was my birthday, so I was kind of excited, we were celebrating my birthday that night. So I went to the meeting, and uh, we had a great time, and after, uh, it was really odd, because the as I look back, it did not seem odd at the time, but we had uh, missionaries that were there from Cuba, and they started to tell the story of their, I think it was brother or nephew, I don't remember exactly, but a family member who was um, a pastor over in Cuba. And the Cuban government had come and taken him in the middle of the night. Uh, his, his wife and kids were there, and they said he was a spy. They arrested him. He was not a spy at all. And they had him for months locked up. And the wife had no idea if she was ever going to you know, see her husband again. And as she's telling the story, it starts to evolve a little bit more. And she says, yeah, in the middle of the night, these two guys in black suits came up to my door. And they said, if you want to see your husband again, you need to grab your children and come with me now. And she's like, okay. You know, they were Americans, so she you know, felt like she was probably safe and in good hands. And um, they did. They rescued her husband. And as you can figure out, it was Navy SEALs that came. And so as she's telling me that, I'm like, oh, oh, my son's a Navy SEAL, you know? He's uh, um, actually over in Iraq right now. And um, as we finished the meeting and we started to have cake and ice cream, and uh, my girlfriend gave me one of the willow tree angels. And those are the angels that have the wooden wings that you see in all the Hallmark stores. And, and I mean, they have the wooden bodies and the wire wings. And the one that she gave me was courage. And she said, you remind me of such a woman of courage with all you've been through in your life. Uh, June 1st, I will have been a widow for 25 years. My first marriage, my husband was very abusive and tried to kill me. So there were lots of things in my past that were, you know, very horrific. And most people probably would have, you know, given up and not persevered. But she said, I I'm just amazed. And you're so positive And, you know, so this represents you. And she gave it to me. And I was like, oh, thank you. And... Just a few minutes later, my phone rang, and I always turned my phone off. And I'm like, oh, doggone it, at least it wasn't in the middle of the meeting. <laughs> and um, I answered my phone. It was my son, Christopher, my oldest son. He was a Marine. He served um, from 2000 to 2005. He got out just before Mark was killed. He was in Okinawa most of that time. And um, met his wife there. I remember when he went over, I said, oh, Chris, don't fall in love over there. You know, she's going to want you to move over there, and I'll never get to see you or my grandkids again. And sure enough, he met a Japanese gal, and they got married, and they have five beautiful children who live about a mile from me. So it's awesome to have them <laughs> close. But um, he called, and unfortunately, he was the one that had to call when we got the notification that my husband had died. And there was nothing in his voice to alarm me. He wasn't talking too fast. He wasn't crying. He wasn't freaked out. And he's like, hey, Mom, where are you? And I said, well, it's Wednesday night. I'm in a small group. Why, what's up? And he said, how long will it take you to get home? And I thought, well, that's kind of an odd question. I don't know, five minutes, seven minutes. Why, what's up? And he said, you just need to come home. And I knew the last time I saw Mark before he deployed and he was here, I knew when he drove away that I would not see him again. I'm not a worrier. I'm not a fretter. That's just not my personality. But something inside told me, and I remember telling Chris at the time, we were both standing there on the front porch, and I said, I don't feel good about this. And he said, neither do I, Mom. So when he told me to come home, I knew what was going to face me when I got home. And I grabbed my purse, and I said, please be praying. Something's not right. 
And I got in my car, and there was a song from my past, and it said, I put my hope in you, O Lord. Trusting you, I will not be shaken. Knowing that you will see me through, I put my hope in you. And I just sang that song over and over and over and over. And I got to the intersection at Bell and Reams, and there was probably three fire trucks and ambulances and three or four police cars. The whole intersection was blocked off. And I remember pulling up to that going, oh, my house blew up. That's all that's wrong. My house blew up. You know, and trust me, I would much rather have lost all of my earthly possessions and still had Mark. And as I got back, I, to this day, I can't even tell you how I got into my, you know, around that mess and got into my subdivision. But when I got in there, there were no more police cars, no ambulances, no fire trucks. And I came back to knowing what was going to face me. And as I turned the corner on my street, I was expecting to see a black car parked out front. I guess I watched too many movies, but there was no black car. There was no cars that I didn't recognize in front of my house. Only my son Christopher just passed pacing back and forth and I parked the car on the you know so I could get out right on the curb and I got out and he said mom the Navy's here and you know when you have loved ones serving you'll get a call if they've been injured they will get you to them they don't come to you and I remember falling on his shoulder and just crying no no and as we walked in the house, they had actually been in my home for about an hour. They'd been trying to find me. And I guess I can be a little elusive at times because Mark actually died that morning. They had been up in Oregon for eight hours waiting for me to come home to my house up there. I did not live there anymore. And finally, the neighbors, after you know they started knocking on neighbors' doors, said, well, she moved to Arizona. She doesn't live here. And I look back to that moment that morning, if they'd have found me, I would have been home alone. So even in the timing of, you know, having my son there with me, but he had gotten a call from my neighbor because they'd knocked on her door, and she said, well, I don't have her cell phone. I know her husband, her son works at Lowe's. So they called Chris, and somehow he got the word that something had happened to me. So he quickly rushed home, and when he got there, again, as a Marine, he knew why they were there. They wouldn't tell him, but so as we walked in, and they said, we're sorry to inform you. Your son, Mark Allen Lee, has been killed in action. And as a parent, that is the most devastating news that you could ever receive. And as I tried to process that, if there was anything I knew at that point, um, I'd seen God walk me through death before. And I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that he would be my strength and what would get me through. And... Um, I didn't even know we had a chaplain there that night. We had two men that were in you know, Navy uniforms that came from the lake, local Keiko office. Usually they send a team of, of SEALs out, but because they were all up in Oregon, they were afraid that I was gonna find out on the news. And so they stayed a little while, and after they left, um, I was sitting on the couch, and I looked out, I had a skinny window next to my door, and I looked outside, and my friends from my small group were outside, and I'm like, Oh, what are you doing? And I'm motioning like, get in here. Why are you standing out there? I need you in here. And uh, my neighbor at the time on the show, so when I motioned in, then they came in and tried to explain to them, you know, what had happened. We hadn't learned a lot of the details at that point, but, and I remember just crying and, you know, talking and they were holding me and hugging me. And they stayed till about midnight. And my oldest son, Christopher, his wife from Japan, had, was back home. Um, before she had five children, she used to go home every summer, but <laughs> it's getting a little costly now. But um, she was back home, and when Mark died, uh, the year before, both of my daughter and daughter-in-law had just lost babies. They were both just three months pregnant, so we were very concerned. <coughs> for the safety of those babies. I'm proud to tell you, both of them made it. But, um, so my son decided he wasn't gonna tell his wife. Now, how on earth he did this in the most painful time of his life, and it was a week and a half before she got home and was able to, you know, communi not expose anything, not lead on that anything was wrong. So he said, Mom, I'm, I'm gonna stay here tonight. I'm like, thank you, son. And he goes, I'm gonna try to get some sleep. Well, I knew there was no way sleep was coming to me. And I just wanted somebody to hold me and tell me it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this. And as a widow, there wasn't. There wasn't anybody else there. I was there by myself. But I knew where my strength was going to come from. 
And so I went and I grabbed my Bible. I knew that was going to provide me comfort. And I opened it. And it opened to Psalms 27, which says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and they fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. And I'm reading that going, God, you could have written this today for the very circumstances I'm going through. And as I got to the bottom of that chapter, it said, I would have lost hope if I had not believed I'd see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And I will strengthen your heart. And I saw that courage thing again. I'm like, okay, I got a courage angel at the beginning of this. And now you're reminding me, courage, I got it, God. Okay, I'm going to take courage. And I remember closing my Bible and sitting there. I could not have felt him any closer to me at that moment than if he was physically there. And I started crying. And crying knowing the deepest pain I'd ever known of losing my son. And I started to get phone calls from the guys overseas once they knew that I'd been notified. And we began to piece together Mark's amazing heroic actions. And I know it took several months for me to comprehend, and I kept asking them, now, what, he, he was where when? What did he do? But the story I'm about to tell you is the actual story of Mark's amazing heroic actions. I don't know how many of you saw the movie American Sniper, but in that movie, Mark is portrayed as Chris's officer. He was the new guy on the platoon. He wasn't really an officer. But they were trying to show how close Chris and Mark were. And if they just showed him as the new guy, he'd only be in that one platoon scene. So then when I was speaking with the producers of it, they said, can we make him an officer? I'm like, yeah, make him an admiral. That works for me. <laughs> and, um, but in that movie, he's the SEAL that was killed in combat. They did not portray him at all. Uh, not his heroic actions, his character, his personality, his humor, nothing. I still think it's an amazing movie. It is not a documentary. If you want to watch a documentary about Mark, go to History Channel, and there's one called The Warfighter, the story of Charlie Platoon and Mark Lee. But that is still a great movie that gives the normal civilian a glimpse into what our veterans have to do in combat, the decisions they have to make, what the families endure back home. And so I still think it's a great movie for most people to see. I just wish they would have portrayed Mark as who he really was. But it gave me another platform to be able to educate people that that wasn't really Mark. But um, I'm going to grab. See, that's what I don't like about this. Hang on, I need water again. I'm going to bring it over here. So... That day, August 2nd, it was 115, 120 degrees in Ramadi, Iraq. Most of you may remember back in 2006, that's where the majority of our casualties were coming from, was Ramadi, Iraq. Mark's teammates said it was the hellhole of Iraq or the worst piece of real estate over there. It was 115, 120 degrees. I've been over to Ramadi. I visited the base, Camp Mark Lee, named in his memory. I've actually got some of the soil up here. He'd mentioned the piece of plaster that actually Mark's teammates cut out of one of Saddam's palaces that was on the base and brought it back to me. When you come up and look at that, that's Saddam's initials. That's the cornerstone from his building. And I'm like, take that, Saddam. <laughs> but um, it was 115, 120 degrees. Mark carried the big gun. He carried anywhere from 150 to 180 pounds. How you do that in that extreme temperature is beyond me. As I said, I've been over there, I felt the heat. It was 133 one day in Kuwait, and I was wearing body armor. But I wasn't carrying a weapon, I wouldn't even carry my water. The guys were carrying that for me, so I can't even comprehend <coughs> how they do that. And there were four seals that were on the rooftop. Mark's buddy Ryan had been severely injured. A sniper had hit his weapon, and so he had shrapnel injuries to the head, and he fell to the ground. Two of the seals that were with him quickly dropped to their knees. Mark could have made that very same choice. But his choice was to stand up into the direct line of fire. He had the big gun. He knew he could lay down some suppressive fire. He was hoping that he could be the distraction so the medic could get up to Ryan. 
The medic got up there and he took one look at Ryan. He said, we got to get him out of here immediately. There's no chance for survival. It's not just once, but then a second time. Mark made the choice by himself to stand up by himself in the line of fire. Obviously, he made the choice by himself. Um, hoping that he could provide that cover again so they all could get down off of the roof. And they did. They successfully got down off the roof. They sent Ryan off for medical attention. And they climbed into their Bradleys. And they headed back to Camp Markley. And as they got in there, they started to rip off their gear and get some water to refresh themselves. And we've watched our Navy SEALs do some absolutely amazing things. Sometimes they seem superhuman to us. But those are my boys, and I can tell you they're just as real as you or I are. Chris Kyle told me later they were pretty sure Ryan had died. They said there's no way that he could have survived those injuries. So they hadn't heard that word, but they're beginning to process that. And the chief came in, said, we just found 30 of the surgeons that just attacked us. And without hesitation, Mark looked at his chief and he said, roger that, let's go get him. So they climbed into their Bradley and they went back to that godforsaken place. They cleared several houses and they went in the last house Mark would be in. They cleared the bottom of it and started up the steps and they heard him yell, on me. And if you served, you know what he was saying. He was saying, I got the lead on this. You guys follow me. And as they went up those steps, they drew fire through a window. And for the last and final time, Mark made the choice again to stand into that line of fire. He didn't duck below the, the wall and let his buddies all be killed. He didn't wait for backup. He didn't weigh the pros and the cons and say, hmm, should I do this or should I not? He knew it was the right thing to do. And one of the verses that you often hear, you know, in the funerals of our, our fallen heroes is John 15, 13, which says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down their life for their friends. And that's what Mark did. He laid down his life for his friends. And I had absolutely no choice, the news that was given to me on August 2nd, 2006. But I did have a choice how I responded. My choice was to put on Mark's boots, which we actually have his boots over here, pick up his weapon, and stay in the fight for every one of you who served. Stay in the fight for every other family who's lost a loved one. And I'm not in the same kind of fight that you guys did that served in combat or that Mark did or we're still fighting today. But it's a fight to make sure that you guys have the medical attention that you need. It's a fight to make sure these other Gold Star families know they're not alone and that they're loved and appreciated. And I've got a copy, we've got a framed copy back on the table that we sell of Mark's Amazing Last Letter Home. There's another copy up here that actually comes with the Mark Lee action figure. And I'll just hold that up real quick. But, and I call this the Mark Lee doll. <laughs> because he would be like, Mother, they didn't make a doll after me. They made an action figure. But make sure you check this out. And um, other than he got a nice tan while he was in Iraq on the doll, it's a little dark, but um, it very much looks like Mark. There's 50 pieces of replica of his actual gear up here as well. I would never have guessed when I held that, held that little baby, I found out two weeks after the divorce that I was pregnant with Mark. And it was a struggle to raise them as a single mom. But I never would have guessed that he would end up being the amazing hero that he was, and that he would change the world in the way that he has. In response to his amazing last letter home, I started America's Mighty Warriors. And we got that name because the meaning of the name Mark means mighty warrior. And I'm sure you will all agree, he definitely lived up to his name. But it's not just about Mark. I tell Mark's story because that's the personal story that I know. It's about all of America's mighty warriors. So each one of you, I, I, anything we could do for you, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have four main programs in America's Mighty Warriors that we do. The first one that we started was directly in response to Mark's letter. 
Part of that letter, he said, when's the last time you paid for a stranger's cup of coffee, a meal, or a tank of gas? When's the last time you helped someone with their groceries into or out of their car? He said, we could change our world and our reputation as a country just by doing that simple thing. And when things started going haywire with the politics and it was so bad there for a while, I'm like, man, if we just did that one thing and did a random act of kindness or somebody on the other side that's arguing with it, I think we would change our world. But um, so that was the first program that we started, doing those things and going out and we saw a veteran or a star family. That's part of the, the cookies for you tonight. That's a random act of kindness. And we get to honor Mark by doing that, accept his challenge. But it's a way we can tell you thank you. You will often find me out at Luke Air Force Base. Um, Todd's been out there with me before. This is uh, Todd Weatherford. Here's, he's our volunteer coordinator in the back in the red shirt and a veteran as well. But we'll go out and we'll just buy tanks of gas and buy coffee and buy, and it's, it's an amazing way to help get through that day. But we've expanded that program and we go up to a $5,000 grant. Our veterans themselves can't come ask for the help because unfortunately we have found quite a few that are just going from charity to charity to see what they can take. And that's not the ones we want to help. We want to help those ones that would never come ask for help. So another veteran, another family member, or someone that knows a veteran could reach out and say, you know, here's the circumstance. Their house burnt to the ground. Their child has cancer. Her husband just committed suicide. Needs help with the funeral. We still vet them, but we'll step, step in and do up to a $5,000 grant. Uh, then we added our program for our Gold Star families. So in uh, Texas, we do two retreats a year for our Gold Star families. It's a beautiful facility, 1,000 acre ranch. Um, it has zip lining, kayaking, canoeing, paddle boarding. One time I said uh, water boarding. I'm like, oh no, no, wait, we, we don't water board. But you bring the terrorists to me, I got no problem water boarding them. Um, horseback riding, uh, everything you could think of. It's got three swimming pools, the you know water slides, and it's a beautiful place just to let these families know you're not alone and we love you. Uh, May 27th this year is we do one at uh, Memorial Day and then we do one around 9-11 that's for our Purple Heart recipients and our Gold Star family. So if any of you are Purple Heart recipients, it doesn't matter what conflict or what time, we would love to have you come. All expenses paid. We pay airfare, the transportation to the ranch, and the whole time that you're there. Um, this year we have our biggest one that we've done, 116 family, no, 116 family members and 26 families that are all brand new families. So we're really excited um, about this one. Uh, then I've always done a lot of advocacy and education. So if there's an injustice against our troops, we'll step in and make that right, whether it's corporation or government, uh, whatever the circumstances. Uh, one of the uh, most prevalent ones that I remember was Delta Airlines back in, I think it was 2008, was charging our veterans coming home from the combat zone excess baggage fees to bring their gear home. And that was my response exactly. Are you kidding me? Well, I, I always want to honor Mark by what I do. I don't ever want to be a Cindy Sheehan wackadoodle woman. Um, but I always verify, so I called Delta Airlines and I said, I understand, this is what I've heard, is that correct? Yes, ma'am, that's our policy. I said, well, you do understand, this is our troops. They didn't go shopping. They're not bringing Turkish rugs home from over there. They're bringing the gear home that they used to defend you and your freedoms. So, well, sorry, that's our policy. Nothing we can do. I said, well, I have a pretty big following, so if you don't want to refund their money to them, I'm going to send it out to my list. I'll be sending you your phone number. I'll be sending uh, email and, you know, address to write to you, and I'll be reaching out to all my media contacts. And he said, fine. Within 48 hours, they had refunded all the money to the veterans and had changed their policy. So you, you can make a difference. You can make a difference. And we need to be doing that you know, for our veterans and for our Gold Star families. The last program that we added is our Helping Heroes Heal program. And we added that six years ago. And with that, we're paying for um, our veterans that have post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. We're paying for hyperbaric oxygen therapy hormone and vitamin therapy, and then we pay for travel costs to a retreat uh, that's called Mighty Oaks, that's a, a faith-based, but it's boot club, fight camp, you know, kind of, you know, circumstances. So it's not, a, you know, a resting camp. Um, and the, um, if any of you want to talk to me, we're now doing spec scans before and after. That's an extra $2,000 cost to get those done. But 
Uh, the fight that I mentioned to you before is part of that process. We've been working with the VA. I had a call with the Secretary of the VA three months ago trying to make the standard of care. If this is what's happening that's actually healing the brains, why would we keep feeding drugs to our veterans? And that, you know, don't, don't process through their kidneys well. Our bodies aren't intended to do that. And oh, by the way, two thirds of them say, well, if you take this, you may have, you know, suicidal tendency. How does that make any sense to give anybody that's depressed a medication that says may cause suicidal tendency? So we're fighting to try to get this to be standard of care. Um, I think we're on the uphill side of this. So uh, but it is a fight. It is a fight. So it will be awesome if we can finally get that done. And actually, for as a government, it is so much cheaper for us to pay for this treatment, which averages about $13,000. It's uh, 40 dives in the hyperbaric chamber. And then we do a year on the hormone and vitamin supplements to get their bodies balanced out again. If we can do these things that are healing their brain, they don't have to be on drugs the rest of their life, it's going to be huge savings to us as a nation as well. And um, those are the four main things that we do. There probably isn't anything I wouldn't do for um, those who served and paid the price for my freedom or other families that have lost a loved one. Um, I would like to show you a video real quick. Uh, it's about six minutes long. And it's actually Mark, when he first started, was on Echo Platoon. He was on SEAL Team 3, uh, and they had Charlie Platoon was the team that he ended up being on. Charlie Platoon and Delta Platoon are the most highly decorated special ops unit ever. Um, at the last minute, they had to let one of the SEALs go from Charlie Platoon. And they said, we need the best seal that you can find because normally they all train together. It's called workup. So they spend months training before they go on a deployment, even if they've been before. And so Mark did not have the benefit of doing the workup with them. He had been doing workup with Echo Platoon, which went to the Philippines. So this is a video from Echo Platoon that they sent to Mama Lee, which is what they call me. Um, and I'm, I'm going to stop at the six minute mark because then they go into the fun and shenanigans and the music gets really, really wild and I just figured most of us didn't want to listen. Oh, we're no. good. We're good. <laughs> but this just gives you a glimpse into some of the training um, that they endure and go through. How many weeks is Bud's? Bud's is about 12 weeks total but they do two years of training before they even go to their first team. So Bud's is just the beginning. That just filters out the weak ones from the strong ones. And are they skilled in what area? SEAL stands for Sea, Air, Land. Okay. So there's no place they don't go. Are they all qualified EMTs? They're not qualified EMTs, but they all have to go through medical training to do the, you know, combat. You know, if you've got someone that is injured there before medic can get to them, so they have some of that basic training. For those that go into the Navy SEAL program, what is the percentage of successful graduate seals about 20% 80% wash out <sighs> yes it's it's a big attrition rate they have tried everything they can think of to try to figure out what makes a good seal um, so they can change that attrition rate and just bring those in that fit that but they can't find anything that is that pinpoint that says this is what it is a lot of the seals do were raised by sing, single moms so their land warfare training that we're seeing now um, takes place out in Nyland, California, just outside of um, El Centro. The kill house that they're in right now is in a little closer to San Diego. so extensive in their training 
that they even bring people in when they're doing the, um, like if they're in Ramadi in the city's training, they have houses built that look like that. And then they will bring, you know, people in to play the part of an Iraqi and, you know, screaming, yelling at them in, in the languages from over there. And they make it as real as they can for these guys. So when they get in combat, they don't waver, you know, one bit. They know exactly what to do. You know, fear isn't something that takes them out. Not that they still don't have fear at times, but they know what to do in the midst of that. Do they train with uh, adversary, adversaries' weapons? That's a good question. I would bet they do, just because, you know, if you're out there and you've, you know, killed them and you need to take the, those weapons, I would think probably, yes. Are those training blanks weapons or is that real ammunition? Some of that is real ammunition. They do both. They, they do the um, the fake stuff and then the, can't think of the term, for <laughs> and then the live live ammunition as well. We actually had a Navy SEAL that was killed in 2008 that they were doing training down in, um, I want to say Tennessee, Kentucky, where they have uh, another kill house that they used to use. And one of the, we're doing live training and one of the bullets went through the wall that they were, it wasn't supposed to and unfortunately killed Alex Ghani. And one of the things that was really interesting with Mark, of course, as I said, he was a, uh, the new guy to the platoon, um, hadn't worked with them. That's Mark there on the left. Um, they uh, would pick on the new guys. You know, it's like an initiation to any other thing. And, uh, Mark carried the big gun, the 50 cal, and uh, he was carrying it with no sling. And they're like, dude, really, you need to get a sling. And they're like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. So they were taking bets behind the scenes. And they said, we give him three days, and we carry it with a sling. And the guy said after he died, um, never did. You've got to be a big, big man. Yes, that's why he carried the 50 cal, because he was six foot one, 220 pounds. A lot of people think that the Navy SEALs are all, you know, like Mark, built the really big guys. And a lot of the guys are actually smaller guys. And it's, you know, to their benefit to get in those... Um, the mini uh, subs that they use um, to get in tight places. But yeah, if you're a big guy, you get the big guns. <laughs> we just celebrated uh, Mark's 41st birthday and we had an event at Scottsdale Gun Club. And Jocko Willink, who was the task unit commander for Charlie and Delta Platoon, uh, was our keynote speaker there. And oh, That was Mark's hands there too. It's funny when I see certain pieces, I'm like, oh, that's Mark. <laughs> but, um, he would, um, on the base, and because I've, I've been there to Camp Mark Lee, um, I'm the first Gold Star mom in history to be in the combat zone where my son was killed. Um, went out on patrol with the 1st to the 4th Cav three different times. Uh, someone was in here tonight with, oh, it was you. Yes, with the 1st to the 4th Cav. Well, I don't know if it's 1st to the 4th, but the Cav logo on his shirt, and that was who I was embedded with over there. Uh, and then I went back in 2010. Nobody was going outside of the wire then. And um, so I basically was just at Camp Liberty, Camp Victory, which is the, the main base there in Baghdad. We did fly up to Tikrit for a change of command. Um, I go over as an embedded reporter, was how they could figure out how to get me over there. And it was an amazing opportunity to be able to do that. The first time I went was uh, Christmas 2007. I think I'm getting to the place I need to stop. The work and play, yes. <laughs> um, the, um, let me take this out so I can get my other video lined up. Were you able to visit the area where uh, Mark was shot? I did not go to the place where Mark was shot. Um, first trip over was uh, Christmas 2007, and I took care packages and Christmas gifts over and celebrated uh, Christmas with all the troops. It was an amazing opportunity. I've got actually some of our... Uh, ladies here from the Arizona Republican group that I belong to, and they put together um, little tiny folded flags in a bag with a note that I also delivered over there for them. But it was uh, am amazing to be there. I was at Camp Mark Lee, but it was still pretty bad in Ramadi in 2007, and I did not have a death wish. That's not why I was going over there. Um, 
when I got this crazy idea to do this, I did reach out to Mark's teammates and I said, I would love to go over there for the purpose of thanking our troops and bringing a piece of America over to those, you know, the uh, other moms and family members that couldn't do that and just love on them on behalf of, of all of America. So it was a, a great opportunity, but it was still pretty severe. The teammates of uh, Mark said, yes, Mama Lee, go. We think that's awesome, you know. Uh, and they said, just don't do any ground transportation. I said, okay. So they flew us in. Um, I had just been on a three-week cross-country um, tour speaking at different events, and we did our last speaking right there at Ground Zero. And then we flew over the next day uh, over to Iraq. And I'd been up like 20, 48 hours. I'd been up two days. And so we got flew in. Um, they take us to um, Kuwait, just like they do for the troops. You go into Kuwait, and then I was embedded once we got to Kuwait. So um, on a then we flew flyover. in to um, Baghdad, and uh, nobody briefed us and told us. My background is aerospace science. I used to fly planes, and we started to land, and we're doing this kind of a landing, and I'm like, oh, this is not good. This is not good. That's how planes crash, not how they land. <laughs> And it's called the corkscrew landing, and they do that because when you fly, like if you watch the planes here coming into Phoenix Sky Harbor, they have typically a rectangle pattern or they'll do a teardrop pattern. It's always the same. It may be a different direction, but that's pretty much what they do all the time. Well, that doesn't work well in a combat zone because they figure out how the plane's going to turn next and then they shoot the plane down. So they're always changing those patterns that they land, and one of the most popular they use is the corkscrew. This woman tends to get motion sickness. <laughs> and so as we're doing this, I'm in a C-130. There's no windows that you can look out and focus on the horizon. That's the trick I learned when I was flying planes. And so I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be so embarrassing. Here's March Mom over here in a weird place anyway, but if I get sick. But I didn't. But, oh, yeah, I was feeling pretty rough when we landed. And so um, got out of the plane and started to go in, and I heard these explosions. You know, I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm in the combat zone, this is it. And um, my thought was Hillary Clinton, you know, when she said, yes, I was being fired on as I ran there. No, they were, we found out later, controlled detonations that were going on on the other side of the base, but nobody told me that. But still, I was just like, okay, I knew this was a possibility. And um, got there, we're flown, waiting for our flight to go from there to the green zone. Um, now that I've been there several times, I know the green zone's only three or four miles away, but um, because I was told don't do ground transportation because it's still, you know, fairly dangerous. So we waited um, probably at least a day, at least 24 hours before they flew us that, that I could have easily walked, walked if it wasn't a combat zone. And um, we got there at where they do your, you know, badges and stuff for the media. And they say, well, it's going to take a couple days. I'm like, good, because I'm tired. I'm going to go sleep. And I was in a very deep sleep. And about two hours later, they came and they said, um, Mrs. Lee, your um, MRAP, which is ground trans transportation, is here to take you. They just brought a casualty in, so they're going to pick you up and take you out to the fog. I'm like, all right, got it. And I'm like, OK, I, I can't be over here and go, excuse me, I'm Mark's mom. Um, I need a plane to come get me. <laughs> So I'm like, all right, this is you know what I signed up for. If it's good enough for the troops, I mean, hello, it better be good enough for me. And um, it was the IED, I think is how you pronounce it, one of their holidays. And some, like we do the fireworks, and we used to do with guns. We don't do that as much in America. But they had taken, they were just shooting off guns, you know, to celebrate their holiday. And again, nobody briefed me. So I'm in the MRAP going, okay, Lord, I know where I know where I'm coming when I leave here, but I wasn't quite thinking that. And again, n nothing happened. We did have a missile go over the base one night, and literally, you can feel that the, the pressure, the explosion, and it woke me up. And of course, you know, I grab my helmet, grab my body armor. I'm in my, you know, pajamas <laughs> going out there, and. Uh, I'm like, what do we do? Where do we go? You know, and they're like, oh no, that was you know, a false alarm. It wasn't, or I think it was another controlled detonation because I could feel that one. And so the next morning, I'm like, okay, so somebody please tell me what the protocol is here for this. How do we handle this if this happens again? And um, so they say, well, the, you know, they'll announce it and then they'll do an all clear when you can get up and, and go. And um, so then we had another one that. 
I don't remember exactly how that worked, but it was the real thing, and I didn't get up for that one because they didn't, I didn't hear anything and didn't feel it good. Um, when I was out on patrol those three times, we weren't fired on at all while we were out there. I mean, we could have been, but um, we didn't have anything going on. It was amazing to meet the Iraqi people, and the first time that I got out of one of the Humvees when we got into, it was the uh, Fog Falcons where we based, and it was the Dora neighborhood. And when um, I got out of the Humvee, the Iraqi kids came running up to me. Of course, I had my hair down then, and it's, you can see very curly. And they pull it up and go, blonde? Blonde? <laughs> and um, I was a Denver Bronco fan until all the stuff started with them. The NFL not wanting to stand for our national anthem and to honor our flag. But when I got out, there was a kid with a Denver Bronco shirt on. I'm like... This is really weird in Iraq, but um, it, it was an amazing experience, and they love us over there. They're so grateful. The main Iraqis, I mean, the terrorists obviously don't, but they very much appreciate, you know, what we have done to, and the sacrifices that have been made. My second trip over, um, I was doing some interviews with one of the Iraqi generals. We had been embedded with um, the Iraqis, with the Air Force unit that I was with. And um, they were trying to you know, build up their, um, their air, air Force, I guess, because all their planes were lost in the beginning. And um, they had taken over a zoo where Saddam had a zoo just like we have here, like our big zoos, whether it's the one on Northern or the one downtown. And um, you know, most people, for their kids, you get a dog or a cat you know, or a bird, maybe. <laughs> he had an entire zoo for his children. That man was wackadoodle. There were several of the buildings over there that we saw, um, and he named his palaces. He never stayed in a palace more than twice. And um, he, because he was afraid people were going to kill him, but, um, like, there was victory over America, victory over Iran. He had one palace after he killed his son-in-laws that he made a Disneyland-style ride for his grandchildren to appease them. And I'm like, really? He just killed their fathers, you know? Come on. But anyway, so he had the zoo that was for children. Well, since he was gone, they were there. And they started working together very closely together. And so I saw relationships that were built between the Iraqi um, general and, and our general. And we went up to a change of command. And I had done an interview with him, asked him a few questions. And my last question was, I don't think um, our media has done a good job of conveying what's really going on over here. And I said, if you could say one thing to the American people, what would you say? And he said, I could see when he swallowed, he got a lump in his throat. And he said, we will tell our children, we will tell our grandchildren, for generations to come, we will tell them what America has done. There's American blood poured out on our soil. And I was glad that was the last question, because that's part of my son's blood. A very dear price was paid, and yet we we never heard that, you know, on, on our, our our news. But um, I had no idea that this would be the course that my life would take me. But it is definitely an honor to be able to stay in the fight for you guys who served. My goal is to every veteran I you know ever meet um, to be able to just to say thank you because I do know who paid that price for my freedom. Um, I don't know where we are time wise. We're in good shape, and, and we'll throw it to some questions okay. when you get ready. Okay. I was just going to go real quick over some of these things sure. that are up here on the table. Um, please, you know, take time to come up here. Uh, we've actually got part of Mark's uniform there in his boot, boots, as I mentioned. Um, Mark earned the Silver Star for his heroic actions um, the day that he died. The Bronze Star with Valor was awarded posthumously for an incident in Ramadi that they'd done in July. And then, obviously, the, the Purple Heart. Um, I'd mentioned the stone here on top of there is actually some of the, the soil from the base of the sign at, at Camp Mark Lee that I brought back from Iraq. And then over on this side, take your time to go through the notebook. There's tons of really interesting stuff in there. Uh, part of his platoon mates are there as well. Picture Chris was like a son to me, Chris Kyle. So there's a picture up there. Um, and probably a quick way to go over everything that's back on the table rather than you know one at a time. 
Um, I mentioned that Mark was one of the main characters portrayed in American Sniper. Uh, we do have that book back there, and I always tell people, if you didn't read the book and just saw the movie, read the book. That's the real story. That's what Chris wrote uh, before he was killed. He dedicated the book to Mark. He tells Mark's story in there. There's uh, lots of different pictures in there of Mark. Um, and then the end of the book, he talks about a woman who's become like a surrogate mom to the teen guys, and that would be me. Um, we were one of two foundations that he supported. I'm always like, it's good enough for Chris Kyle. It should be good enough for the rest of the world. Um, the rest of the books on the table were written by his teammates that were with him as well, and they dedicate their books to Mark, uh, the, the hardback books. The last Punisher, um, Kevin Lace, was the medic that was with Mark when he died. He dedicates his book to Mark, and um, you see when you read that book how much Kevin and Mark uh, were good friends. Um, he was asked to uh, train Bradley Cooper in the movie, who played Chris, as to hand signal, hand movement, how to look like a seal, act like a seal, and um, Bradley said, why don't you play yourself? So he does play himself in the movie. Um, just a note, they asked me to play myself, but I wasn't good enough to be me. <laughs> but I, after I saw the movie, I know why, because I questioned them, and I said, um, if you're not reading the rest of Mark's letter, if you read those first two lines the way they are, it totally takes it out of context. And they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm sure that's not what we're doing. And um, so they said, well, just sit down on your phone, you know, film yourself and read Mark's letter. I'm like, well, where am I reading it? Am I reading it when I'm speaking at a group like this? Am I reading it when I first got it as an email and Mark was alive? Because that was two and a half weeks before he died that he wrote that. Or am I reading it at his funeral? Because that's going to be a whole lot of different emotion. They said, just sit down and read it. I'm like, okay. Um, and I did, and the casting director said, man, we loved what you did. That was awesome. I'm like, oh, okay. Maybe I'll get a play in the movie. And then I didn't hear anything, didn't hear anything. And finally, three weeks later, the casting director called and said, you know, Clint said that was a great reading, but we need someone who can act. And I'm like, okay, all that lady did in that thing was sort of read it in a tear or two. I'm like, but anyway, I'm glad if I see the movie in retrospect that it wasn't actually me because I would have had a fit, you know, and I think that's what they figured. She probably would have said, uh, uh, we're not doing it this way. And they either had to rewrite the script or fire me and get somebody else. So, but, um, he was good enough to play himself, so he did. The next two books, um, Mark's task unit commander, Jocko, and Leif, the last time Mark stood in line of fire was to save Leif. Um, he married Jenna Lee, who was at Fox News, and their, their first son is named after Mark. So, um, Great leadership books. The next one, the field manual, Jocko wrote that. Uh, motivational, if you guys don't follow Jocko, whoa, whoa, you're missing out. You should. He does an amazing podcast. He uh, retired and now has a company that does leadership training around the world. Uh, actually just did a contract with Arab Emirates, I believe, to be able to train their leaders over there. Um, then we've got three kids' books that Jocko wrote. Toughest warrior we have in America. If you see his face, I mean, he's a mean, buckle dragon looking. Um, the two books, The Way of the Warrior Kid, Mark is the main character in there. The first one is From Wimpy to Warrior. And when he was writing, he said, Mama Lee, I'm not saying Mark was wimpy, but I just want to honor him by making him the character in the book. Um, instantly, he is raised by a single mom. There's no dad in the picture. but um, So some similarities there. But uh, And then he wrote Mikey and the Dragon, which is like a Dr. Seuss rhyming book. You know, it's pretty crazy, but uh, amazing. And then the next four books, I'm a contributing author in those, and they all tell Mark's story in different ways uh, in there as well. And we've got our t-shirts and challenge coins and things. But... Um, I think that's pretty much what else is over here. So feel free to take your time. Don't forget cookies, and then let's just open that up for any questions. And I'm good. I mean, don't hesitate to ask anything. I don't think there's anything you could ask that I wouldn't want to answer for you. Which uh, the picture of the three? The, there's obviously the marine. Yes. And then which one is your son? Okay, which one do you think would be my son? <laughs> Oh, well, you're right. But the one that looks most like me is the one in the middle. That's my son-in-law. The other two are my sons. So and people would always say, oh, so nice of you to adopt a family. I'm like, uh, I worked hard for all three of those kids. I have a daughter that's in the middle between the two boys as well, but that's her husband. So the oldest, my oldest son served in the Marines. Son-in-law was Army. Mark was Navy. My brother just retired after 33 years in the Air Force. So I can do the hoo-yah, hoo <laughs> And Air Force, I've been asking this question for three years. What's your chant? You don't have one. So I had to make it up. It's a jacuzzi. 
<laughs> Seriously, we need all branches of the military to do what they do. So thank you all. But any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Are there female seals? No, there are no no female Navy seals, and I hope there never is. So. And not that I don't think, I, I think in combat, I know the way I raise my boys, that if there were a female Navy SEAL with them, they would be watching her and protecting her. And they wouldn't be able to focus on what their mission was or what they're doing. I think there are amazing things that women can do in the military. I think there's places where women can be leaders in the military. I just don't think that being on the combat field is the right place for them. As a female veteran, I agree with you. Thank you. We have no business out there because they're going to pay more attention to us than yeah. the guy on the other side. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, if they want to make a real good combat group, make it all women. <laughs> <laughs>